And welcome to Wednesday night Bible study here at Faith and Victory Church. So glad you could join us tonight and uh, trust you're having a wonderful week and um, not had to deal with uh, anything weird like demons in the classroom or anything like that. Hallelujah. And uh, that's another story for another day. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We are glad to have you with us tonight and uh, trust that you've been your week has just been lovely. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. We're in lesson 13 of um, the Bible in the light of our redemption. And we want to uh, have you invite your friends to join us. So go ahead and send that out real quick. And um, praise the Lord. Glory to God. All right. Last week we talked, we began talking about the tabernacle and you know, how the representation and the, out, the uh, outer coverings and the, um, <clears throat> the tapestries that hung within and the symbolism there. We'll continue teaching tonight on the tabernacle and going inside. We're going to move inside the tabernacle and um, we'll, we'll uh, go from there. Um, in the beginning with the gate, God, uh, where, where God ended his instructions that he gave to Moses concerning the building of the tabernacle. Now, God gives him the instructions and begins with the ark uh, in the Holy of Holies and the mercy seat on top of the ark and uh, works from the ark to um, the brazen um, labor at the other end of the uh, tabernacle or, you know, um, and, and, and ultimately the tent. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, not the tent, but the um, temple. Remember, the, tab the temple was built just like the tabernacle, just as a permanent structure, okay? Um, but the, ar the arrangement was the same. So begins with the ark, mercy seat, God's presence to the brazen altar, uh, at the entrance into there, hallelujah. Um, and then, um, goes the brazen, so that it comes to the labor, which is before the altar there, and then the altar and then to the gate. So you, you know, it goes that way. Now this was, um, and God's description began from Because couldn't come to God, God had to come to man and meet him at uh, his place of sin. God had to meet him at his place of sin and then return uh, back to his throne. <clears throat> so, um, the gate typifies Christ. Remember, Jesus says, I am the door. No man enters in but by me. Hallelujah. Uh, spiritual man dead man is on the outside must come through Christ um, because Jesus is the way um, God remember drove man from the garden of Eden and now he's providing a way back um, when you look at the other three sides of the uh, tabernacle there was no door there was only one door that was that you had to go through Jesus Jesus says I am the way the truth the life no man comes to the Father but by me. Hallelujah. And so there was only one way in. Um, and then you, when you come to the eastern opening and come to the gate uh, the gate where you see the blue, the purple, the scarlet, the fine retwined linen, remember that from last week, um, all representing Christ um, who is the door. The furnishings in the tabernacle. You know, we've mentioned before, God began with the ark and worked the way to the brazen altar. This is the typical of the path trod by Christ. Jesus left the throne, came to earth, became man, became sin for us, went to the cross, um, reconciled us and led captivity captive and brought us into the presence of God. Hallelujah. Um, so from the ark that was in the most holy place or the holy of holies, uh, to the brazen altar that stood near the gate, Christ did this in the spiritual, supernaturally for us. Praise God. That's, that's shouting grounds right there, church. Um, I, had a, I had a student ask me today, uh, what's, your what's your favorite scripture, Mr. Taylor? And uh, 
So I told him, you know, Hebrews 9, uh, for the blood of bulls and goats is a sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He said, what does that mean? <laughs> and I said that it means that Jesus is the only way for man to reach the Father. Now, uh, I didn't offer this information on my own, didn't even bring it up. He, he came and asked me. So I, I shared with him because he asked me. Hallelujah. But um, it just makes me think of this, that Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer. Jesus has it uh, settled it for all, that we could not approach God on our own. We, could own, we, we had to stand without the gate, but he became the door and said, whosoever will. Amen. Hallelujah. <coughs> Let's look at the altar. Um, its position is at the gate. It's where Christ met a spiritually dead man. The materials were wood and uh, or brass and acacia wood. Um, the wood is spoken of as incorruptible wood. Uh, that's Jesus who had no sin. But it was covered with brass. Um, the candlestick, the altar of incense, the table of showbread, and the art were made of gold, but not the altar. The altar was covered in brass because it spoke of sin. Okay? It was the altar of the cross that the sin was, <coughs> that man's sin fell upon Christ. At the cross, Christ was forsaken of God. The brazen altar shows. Christ's identification with man on the cross. You know, uh, brass has a similar, uh, not, not purely, but a similar um, golden effect like gold does. However, because it's not pure, it, it's, it's not the truth. So brass symbolizing you know, man's fallen state from glory into sin instead of pure gold purified before the Father. And he had to come to the brazen altar. And hallelujah. God came from his mercy seat all the way to the brazen altar to meet man there, to identify with man. Um, where he, he met the guilty Israelite who had in obedience to God's command brought to the altar a perfect sacrifice. Hallelujah. This was an expensive act of the one who brought the sacrifice. He should lay his hand upon the head of the goat that was identifying himself with the sacrifice, confessing that he deserved to die, but that God had provided the substitute. As the fire consumed the sacrifice, there was no judgment left to fall upon the sinner. And the one who had been brought the sacrifice could go away from the altar with the knowledge his sin had been forgiven. For God said in Leviticus 4.26, he shall be forgiven. At the cross, we see Jesus taking man's place, identified with all that man was, and God's judgment falling on him. Hallelujah. And then the brazen laver. Beyond the altar stood the laver, and the laver was made of brass also, which spoke again of sin. It was this basin filled with water, which um, with which the priests washed the dirt of the cursed earth from their hands and their feet before they entered the Holy of Holies. This typifies the daily need of washing of water by the word of God. We need to be in the word of God. We need to let the word of God work in our lives and, and um, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hallelujah. Amen. And the Bible goes on and talks about by the washing of the water of the word. Praise God. Now in the holy place, not the holiest of all, but the holy place. So this, the holy place is after the gate, the labor, the altar and the labor. Now even into the holy, holy place was a table of showbread with 12 loaves of bread. Now, a loaf is an emblem of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that um, from different scriptures. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10, we being, um, we being many are one body. Hallelujah. Um, we being many, just like that, wheat in the bread. Just as wheat in the loaf became uh, merged into one loaf, you know, you got the wheat and you, you knead it and bake it. It becomes a, a unified one thing. Through the baking on the grounds of Christ's identification with us on the cross, becoming all that we were, and in burial, paying our penalty through the, his death and burial, suffering for us until the Father, <clears throat> until the Father once again said, Thou art my beloved Son, this day have I begotten thee. On the, in the crucifixion, through Christ, we see who we were. In his resurrection, we, we see ourselves as he is. Romans 5, uh, 6, 5 through 6. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, so that we should no longer be in bondage to sin. He is the bread of life. Now we become the carriers of this life to the world. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> he is the bread of life. And after this, um, the, the table of showbread, we have um, the golden lampstand, which um, speaks of our identification with Christ in the likeness of his resurrection. Here we see the union of Christ in his body. Um, we read the word branches, um, taught, describing the golden candle stand. And it was seen as though the central shaft of the light stand and the branches had come out of it. And we're reminded of the words of John. I am the vine, you are the branches. In John 15, 5. Union with Christ was wrought through our identification with his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, the lampstand, God gave specific, detailed instructions on how it was to be made. Um, it had to be, listen to this, it had to be hammered out, and the scripture says in Exodus 25, 36, one beaten work. Um, the workman bruised the precious metal. You can't think, help think of Isaiah 53, 5, by his bruises we are healed. Uh, King James uses the word stripes, but bruises is, a, is a, another alternate translation. Only by the bruising could the branches of the lampstand be brought into existence. And only by identification of God's son with our spiritual death, only um, by his paying the penalty for our sin, could we become absolutely one with him. It was him be, his being bruised in our stead under our judgment that we were able to take place as a son or daughter of God before the Father. Um, and the resurrection is revealed here. Is there, if there's anything in the lampstand that would sh definitely show he was portraying our identification with him in his resurrection, yeah. Um, it was to be ornamented with fruit blossoms. Now that fruit, uh, what fruit did God choose? He had a wide field of different types of fruit he could have choose, chosen, and he, did, he decided the almond tree. In, do, in number 17, uh, we had the act of Aaron's rod. It with the other 11 was laid up before the Lord all night. In the morning, he brought forth buds, blossomed flowers, and yielded the almonds. Um, we are the branches bearing fruit because of our union with him. Like Aaron's rod, Christ the living one was cut down in death, suffered until our penalty was paid. He, was risen, he has risen to be the first fruits of them that sleep. He was made alive. We were made alive with him. Um, he could not, the, the uh, craftsman could not make the lampstand separately. Couldn't like build the shaft and then, you know, beat the uh, branches that came out of the lampstand and then tie them in later. Um, because it, would, it, would, it had to be, a one beaten work. And so it had to be a, a true, true 
reflection of the union of man with Christ. We are birthed out of him. And it had to be out of one piece of gold. Um, one beaten work of pure gold. Gold is a symbol of deity. Uh, we know on the altar, in the labor, we saw they were made out of brass. Uh, that spoke of, of the judgment that rested upon Christ when he identified with us as our substitute. But now in resurrection, he is the fullness of, um, in the fullness of his divinity, we're made alive. Joint heirs with him. The brass shows him made, made sin. The gold shows our being made the righteousness of God in him. So, the labor, the altar were brass representing sin, but now we get to the lampstand and the branches. He's the vine, we're the branches. I would that you bear much fruit, that's talking about us, are meat beaten out of one piece of gold, symbolizing that we are one in complete identity and union with Christ, born out of him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so we, and, and his divinity and his divineness flows into us as children of God. Praise the Lord. Can you say hallelujah? Happy claps. A couple of dancing feet, something. Amen. <clears throat> Thank God. God was meticulous in why things had to be done a certain way. And then when we come to the realization of what he was doing and, and the symbolism and the typology, um, and then it, it, it reinforces the written doctrine of the New Testament of our, our, our identification with Christ. And all along, God was hiding these types and foreshadows in the tabernacle itself where they could actually see it. I like to say this a lot of times. God put the tabernacle and everything in it so together that they couldn't miss Messiah coming if he was wearing a um, pink feather in his hat with white shoes on. And they still missed it. <clears throat> Bless their hearts. Or as Brother Hagin used to say, darling, stupid heads and darling hearts. Um, now the altar of incense, again in the holy place, before the veil stood the golden altar of incense. The word altar signified a place of slaughter, yet no sacrifices were offered here. We see that the brazen altar, the laver, so forth Christ's identification with our spiritual death, and that the table of showbread and the golden lampstand showed our identification with him in the resurrection. Now the altar of incense speaks of his ascension to the Father. Incense, you know, as the incense would float up. The altar suggests his blood that had been shed. It was his own blood that he entered into the Holy of Holies in heaven, having obtained eternal redemption for us. The materials of the altar reiterate once more the truth about his person. The gold proclaims his deity. The wood shows his, shows his humanity. It brings us to the glorious fact that we have at the right hand of God, a man, the man Christ Jesus. And we were raised up with him and made to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So the, the, the man Christ Jesus, the one, God who became man so he could redeem our, from our sin, now sits at the right hand of the Father. Hallelujah. Deity and mankind joined together and because of our relationship and acceptance of him, we are now unified with him and have become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And then we move past all of this. I'm thinking of that song right now. Uh, past the brazen altar into the holy place. Um, somebody help me out here. Yeah. Take me into the Holy of Holies. There we go. Holy. Well, after you pass all of this, we go to the Holy of Holies. Thank you. Y'all finally got me there. I was. Hallelujah. Do I now? 
I got the cheap seats out here. Hallelujah. Um, we go into the Holy of Holies, where God's actual presence abode in the tabernacle. And the mercy seat formed the cover of the ark. At each end was a cherubim whose outspread wings overshadowed the mercy seat. Now, if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's kind of a, a, a fairly um, accurate depiction of what the, the um, Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat looked like. Um, I'm not going to say it's exactly like it, but you get a good idea of what we're talking about. Um, in Romans 3, 24 and 25, it says, Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation. Now, in the Greek, Septuagint, in the, in the Septuagint, the word uh, propitiation is translated mercy seat. So you can read it this way, whom God set forth to be a mercy seat. We might ask ourselves how the throne of the holy, sin-hating God could be a mercy seat and not a throne of judgment. Leviticus 16 gives us the account of the Day of Atonement. On that day, there were two goats brought before the Lord. Lots were cast upon them. One of the goats was a scapegoat. If you remember that, that's where the term scapegoat actually comes from. And having had their sins of the congregation confessed over it by Aaron, was sent away into the wilderness to some uninhabited place to let go and never to return. And the judgment of God would fall on it and consume it. The other goat... Um, it was spoken of as, as, as for the Lord. By the scapegoat spoke of substitution. This goat spoke of propitiation or mercy. Christ on the cross of Calvary did the work on the ground of which God can deal with condemned humanity in mercy. <clears throat> Christ was set forth to be a mercy seat. And spiritually man, dead man can meet with God. We shall look at that, what was done with the goat that was for the Lord and the one which was spoke of for pituation. It was killed. Then some of its blood was carried into the holiest and sprinkled on the, uh, by the priest on the mercy seat seven times. Um, the burning outside the camp would see the type of the Lord Jesus dying under the judgment of God on our behalf. But as we see him arise from the dead and pass into the heavens with his own blood, we have the answers to this type of the priest going into the holy with the blood of the goat. Think about it. While God judged the scapegoat out in the wilderness and it was consumed on the mercy seat of God, the blood uh, of the other goat was placed on the altar of mercy. Okay? There's something suggestive about how the cherubim is upon the mercy seat. Remember the first time the cherubim mentioned in the word of God is when um, man was driven from the garden of Eden and he set a cherubim there uh, with a flaming sword to keep the way of the garden so that man couldn't enter in and eat of the treat of the fruit of the knowledge, I mean, uh, the treat of, um, <coughs> of the tree of life. I'm sorry. Here though, these cherubims have no flaming sword the way back to God had been made. There's no angel keeping us from the tree of life. They are there overshadowing <clears throat> the place of the giving of life. Hallelujah. They look at the mercy seat as um, Kenya states here, as if to want to know the meaning of the blood that's on that, uh, on the uh, mercy seat. That blood tells us how God's throne in Israel has become a mercy seat and not a throne of judgment. He who sat upon the throne saw in the blood the type of blood of him who deemed not his equality with God a thing to be rightly grasped, one whose death would satisfy all the claims of justice. Philippians 2.6 Remember Jesus lay aside his rights to deity and to glory. And walked among us as a man. Hallelujah. Because of that blood, he could meet Israel in person, in the person of their high priest. Remember, we have a high priest which, um, uh, which can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Hallelujah. Was every point tempted like we are yet without sin. 
and extend mercy to us instead of judgment. Hallelujah. Over the law that no spiritual man, dead man could keep and that only uh, could only condemn. Remember, the law could only condemn. It could not give life. The blood stains that remind God of the righteous work of his son are placed on that mercy seat before his throne. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <clears throat> so the tabernacle laid out as it was um, shows God coming to man, making a way for man to enter in, for man to uh, identify with Christ, be washed and cleansed of his sin, to be unified with Christ, <clears throat> And now come into the holy place with God where he is accepted and held in esteem in union with God. Hallelujah. In his holy presence. So let's look at our questions. Hallelujah. Yeah, somebody, yeah, somebody, take me in. That's right. Take me in. Glory to God. How does the gate represent Christ? Uh, the gate was the only way into the tabernacle. Thus, it represents Christ as the only way to the Father. Amen. You know, I, I've seen you know all kinds of stuff, pictures of Jesus and Buddha and you know Hindu gods and uh, it, uh, Muhammad, and he is one of many. No. Now, let me say something, folks. I mean, he, Jesus made it as plain as he can make it. You can't mix him up and put him in with the, all the other guys as one of the ways. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, either he is, or he isn't. But he can't be one of many. He can't be one of the, of the guys and just be one of the ways. His claim, his claim to deity, his claim to redeemer, his claim to being God manifest in the flesh is, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I am the only way. So you, you can't kind of try to make it sound real, you know, uh, equitable, you know, and politically correct that everybody is one of the, can have their own way. And he's just one of them. As a Christian, as a believer, in truth, he's either the biggest liar that ever walked the face of the earth or is who he said he was. And I accept him as who he said he was. The only way. Um, what great feature of our redemption in Christ is typified by the general plan of the furniture of the tabernacle? Now, when God gave instructions to Moses, God began with the ark and worked towards the brazen altar near the gate. Man could not approach God. God must come to man. Christ came from glory to earth then to the cross where he met spiritually dead man and then back again to the Father. Hallelujah. And what do the brazen altar and labor signify? Most of the furniture in the tabernacle was covered with gold except, and that really shouldn't be most, all the furniture in the, in the tabernacle was covered with gold except the altar, brazen altar and labor. Brass spoke of sin. It was the altar of the cross that the sin that was man's fell upon Christ. The brazen altar shows Christ's identification with man on the cross. The brazen laver represented our daily need uh, to be washed with the cleansing of the water of his word. Hallelujah. How did the showbread re represent the body of Christ? The bread is an emblem of the body of Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 17 states that we being many are one bread or one body, just as the wheat and the loaf bread became we in the loaf became merged into one loaf 
to the baking on the grounds of Christ's identification with us on the cross, becoming all that we were and in burial, paying our penalty. We became what he is. Hallelujah. How did the golden lampstand reveal the sufferings of Christ? <clears throat> God told Moses to make the lampstand in a very specific way. It had to be hammered out of one beaten work. We see the workmen bruising the metal, banging, beating the metal. Um, we, Isaiah 53, 5, by his bruises, we are healed. Only by this bruising could the branches of the lampstand be brought into existence. And only by identification of God's son with our spiritual death, only by his paying the penalty that was ours, could we become absolutely one with him. And how did it show our identification in his resurrection? The branches of the lapstone were to be ornamented with fruit blossoms. And God chose almond blossoms like that of Aaron's rod that budded. We are branches bearing fruit because of our union with Christ. Like Aaron's rod, Christ the living one was cut down in death, suffered our penalty uh, until our penalty was paid. He has now risen to be the first fruits of them that are asleep. When he was made alive, we were made alive with him. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? And what part of the ark was the mercy seat? It was the cover of the ark. And why could God's throne in Israel be a mercy seat and not a judgment throne? Because the blood of the goat that was sprinkled on the mercy seat represented propitiation and not judgment as did the scapegoat. Christ was our propitiation of mercy seat. And what was suggested in the attitude, in, in the way that the cherubims were designed and, and, and uh, placed? The first time we find a cherubim in the Bible is in connection with the driving out of the garden of Eden of our parents, forefathers. Uh, the cherubims are seen connected with a flaming sword, but there is no sword here. Nothing that would say, keep away. Then we see the gaze is toward the mercy seat as if desiring to look into the meaning of the blood that were upon, placed there by the high priest. These blood marks tell us how God's throne in Israel became a mercy seat. And why was the law placed into the ark? The law was placed in the ark because the mercy seat with the blood, with the blood on top, were reminding us of God's righteous work of his son. I think I must have skipped that in here somewhere. I, I knew that was coming um, as I studied that. I'm just thinking where I missed that. Um, but let's just say, you know, God put the law into the mercy seat, I mean, into the ark, and then covered it with the, the mercy seat and the blood of Christ declaring that the conditions of the law were met and kept by the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not by our obedience to the law, but through the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Somebody say amen. Somebody say glory. A to the men. So next time we join together, um, we're going to go into the priesthood. There's, there's so much, there's so much um, symbolism in the tabernacle, the priesthood. I mean, all, uh, of um, God bringing us to Christ, and, and what that means. Remember, this is the Bible in the light of our redemption. Hallelujah! And so. Um, we, we move now, we're going to be moving right next week, the priesthood, the following week, the offering. Then there comes the great day of atonement. Um, then it goes to the uh, synopsis of Old Testament books. Then we get to the incarnation, the life of the... So we're, we're moving towards it. We keep building all the foreshadowing, all the typology, all the things that God required. All that was there to point us to Jesus. To point us to Jesus. Um, because God had a plan. Behold the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world to reconcile us to the Father. 
Hallelujah. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and make us unto our God a kingdom of priests. In Jesus' name, can you say amen? Hallelujah. Well, I um, want you to know, praise the Lord, um, today begins our 24 days of knowing the reason for the season. Hallelujah. There'll be a post on social media every day. There'll be a post on media every day um, in, in relation to knowing the reason for the season. So you can re, um, read this aloud. And um, as we go through the next 24 days, you can take that with your family time and look over and read the knowing the 24 days of knowing the reason for the season. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, we'll give you an opportunity to give. Uh, glory to God. If you have your offerings and you want to give electronically through PayPal or our cash app, you can do that at this time. And um, praise the Lord. We just, we're excited about what God's doing at Faith and Victory Church. Love to have you be a part of it. And join us financially. If you're watching us online, um, we, we welcome you to join us um, um, virtually and even in person. Uh, we're currently meeting at uh, the facility of New Life Family Church on Sunday afternoons at 1 o'clock, um, 6701 Ken Coy Road in High Point. Uh, love to have you come out and join us on Sunday afternoons. As soon as we find our own permanent location again, we will um, be moving back into a 10, 10, 30, 10 o'clock, 1030 service. Hallelujah. And uh, we're looking forward to that too, praise the Lord. And getting back together on Wednesday nights for in-person time uh, during the middle of the week. But, uh, you know, until then, we're doing what we, what we need to do. And so um, just know we love you. We appreciate you. And remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time here at Faith and Victory Church online. Have a great week, everybody.